In parts one and two, we examined how we ended up with our current model of the atom and some of the phenomena that this model is not capable of explaining. Let's examine a different way of looking at the atom, which may well be capable of explaining not only these issues, but offer a fundamentally new understanding of the basic building blocks of our universe. The Structured Atomic Model was created by Ido Kahl 12 years ago, and there is now a team of people who work on this from many different aspects continually refining and seeking answers. Unhappy with the conventional model, and with the many mysteries that this throws up, he sets himself the challenge of rewriting the book on the atomic structure. The basic premise of Sam is beautifully simple. There is no such thing as a neutron. The neutron is redefined instead as a proton and an electron. Two protons can be held inside of the nucleus using this electron. This means that the force holding these particles inside the atom is not the mysterious strong force, but instead this concept postulates the use of the electromagnetic force. The charge of this nucleus is still plus one, but it contains the mass of two protons and an electron. And this is why we think the neutron has no charge and has a mass which is slightly heavier than a proton. As this force acts across all particles, it will cause the nucleus to settle so that the particles are spaced as tightly together as possible. This is referred to as the densest packing geometry. This will create compact spherical shapes which form the building blocks from which the larger nucleus structures are built. Each of these components will form the densest packing shape, but the entire nucleus will not, as this is created by combining these shapes together. The most stable shapes are the tetrahedron, the icosahedron, and the pentagonal bipyramid. Each element in the periodic table is made of these shapes joined together in a semi-static state. Let's examine some of these basic blocks to understand how an atom can be constructed in this model. When we examine the periodic table, you will notice that most of the time you need to add one proton and one neutron to get to the next element. There are, however, some exceptions to this, and the conventional model cannot explain why this is the case. In the following sequence, you will see that I show how many particles need to be added in both the conventional and the SAM model to get to the next element. We start by looking at deuterium. In the conventional model, this is made of a proton and a neutron. Here we have two protons joined together by an electron. If we examine this structure, you will see that there are two areas of positive charge, and this allows the outer electrons to have two poles to be attracted to. The electron at the center is either toroidal shaped or has a particle which rotates around the touching points or is smeared out. Helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons, and in this case, in the SAM model, we have two deuteriums connected across the central electron, forming a tetrahedron shape. As we now move across the periodic table, you will start to see a pattern appearing. Starting with lithium, we again add a deuterium. Here, we see the atoms arrange themselves into the densest packing shape, and in this case, this is a pentagonal bipyramid. And this leaves several open spaces where we could once again add a deuterium to move to the next element, beryllium. From beryllium, we continue to add deuterium to the same face we were adding to before. And this makes boron. As we continue adding deuterium in each step, the protons will rearrange themselves into the densest packing shape. Slowly, the gap in the middle grows until we reach carbon. Here, each proton now touches five other protons and the shape is perfectly symmetrical. It is an icosahedron. Carbon represents the most basic structure of the nucleus. It is the most densely packed and has the strongest binding energy and is the basic building block upon which the next elements are built, as well as the building block for life itself. From here, we can add deuterium to any of the sides and in doing so will bring us to nitrogen. Continuing to add onto the same face with nitrogen, we move to oxygen. From oxygen, we need to add one proton and two neutrons in the old model to move to the next element. But in our case, we would add one deuterium and one proton electron pair. The structure will determine to a large extent where the protons can be located. 
you will notice on the oxygen structure that there is a gap growing here, and this will restrict a proton from wanting to settle there. If we examine fluorine, we see that one of the protons will occupy the spot near the previously added deuterium, and the others will have to start at a different location. These simple rules mean that finding the location and the shape of the nucleus is almost self-deterministic. Now we just add one additional proton and we jump to neon. This now creates a shape that is symmetrical across the center. From here, in order to jump back to the start of the table, we need to add one proton and two neutrons. So in our case, we would be adding one proton electron pair and one deuterium. And we now have sodium. And if we compare the shape, we will see that it is the same ending on one side as lithium, which sits above it. Moving along to magnesium, you will now see two active areas which are essentially two lithiums. As we continue to move across, you will see that aluminium has striking similarities to boron, which is above it. When we jump to silicon, we once more see that at this point, the end to which we were adding protons has become full and looks like a carbon on one end. So this pattern continues across the periods. Each time we add a proton or an electron-proton pair, there are only a certain number of possible locations it can go in. As you build, you are adding to a tetrahedron shape, and this determines valid places that they can be added. This means that there are certain shapes that are not stable. You will notice that sometimes the number of particles added is not always consistent in the periodic table. This is a mystery in the conventional model. But using SAM, we can understand why some of these atoms are not possible or are not stable. It is because of the fact that some of these intermediate structures are not stable. And this is due to the geometry. And this is something that we will explore in more detail in a future video. As we continue to add to the nucleus, it creates nodes from which further protons can be added. Initially, this is at either end, but as the structure grows, branches will start to appear on the sides and ends. As these branches grow and the nucleus gets larger, these branches can start to interfere with each other. The branches will determine what products are created in nuclear reactions. No more will it be random, but now it depends on where an incoming neutron strikes, as to how a branch breaks. We will explore this in much greater detail separately. The shape of the nucleus and the fact that we see similar shapes within the groups is the reason why they have similar properties. If you wish to explore these patterns in more detail, you can explore the SAM periodic table as well as the Atomic Builder at the etherealmatters.org website. I will put the link down in the description. There are many aspects that this model could help explain, from magnetic moments to the boiling and melting points, and at the same time, it makes us question some fundamental assumptions about what electrons are, and whether they really orbit the nucleus, and what exactly a proton is. This model makes no presumptions on any of these, and can comfortably work with either a solid particle or not. So let's jump back to the structure of the atom and ask some initial questions which will hopefully set your mind in the direction that we'll be heading for in the future. In order to hold the protons in the nucleus, this model employs the electromagnetic force. The electron acts as a glue binding the protons in the nucleus. The question then becomes, if it can do this, what does it look like? Examining some of the more complex atoms reveals that in some cases, it is better to consider the electron as smeared out particles which exceed the size of the proton. It acts like a glue which is able to extend outwards. Nuclear decay reactions so as that when a neutron is ejected, it quickly decays into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. In this model, we see that this came from the proton and the electron pair in the nucleus. So does the electron change shape once it becomes decoupled from the proton? Why is this pairing not stable outside the nucleus? And what on earth is the neutrino? And what was its equivalent in the nucleus? At this point, it is important to note that this is work in progress. And although Edo and the SAM team have made great progress, there are still many unanswered questions. Some of these questions we will also be exploring together with Edo and the team. 
In the coming episodes, we will examine the evidence that underpins this model from both nuclear reactions and sapphire, as well as explore alternative ideas for the electron and the proton, and the structure mechanics of the SAM model itself. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.